So it was this culture that was very much about like shaming you. So, you know, doors were locked. If you got the answer to the question, where did the Dow close wrong? You were like kicked out, you know, many times in tears. Um, so it was just this kind of like rule by fear and shame. And that's kind of very early on. I was just, it was very hard for me to kind of marry. Well, this is where everyone wants to be. And yet this is where everyone wants to be like, yeah. you know, um, but again, not having any experience in finance, not knowing anybody who worked in this world, I was just like, well, I guess this is just the way it is. And I just should shut up and be grateful I got here. Welcome to Imposters, the show where I have revealing conversations with world-class execs, athletes, and entertainers about their personal challenges and how overcoming those challenges has shaped their careers and lives for the better. I'm your host, Alex Lieberman, co-founder and executive chairman of Morning Brew. My guest today is Jamie Fiore Higgins. Jamie is a former managing director at Goldman Sachs and author of the book, Bully Market, my story of money and misogyny at Goldman Sachs. For those less familiar with the finance industry, Goldman is one of the top investment banks in the world. And it is famously said that it's easier to get into Harvard than it is to score a job at Goldman. Jamie landed one such extremely rare opportunity upon graduating from Bryn Mawr in 1998, and she would spend the next 17 years climbing the ranks at the firm until she reached the prestigious title of managing director. Not only was this an amazing accomplishment on its own, but it was also something extremely rare for a woman to do. And for Jamie, her experience at Goldman was not unlike some of the extremely sexist depictions you see about Wall Street in the movies. My full conversation with Jamie Fiore Higgins right after this quick break. Staying hydrated is one of the simplest ways that you can take care of yourself and your health. It can also be one of the first things to become an afterthought when your focus gets pulled away. Action Ion Charged Alkaline Water can make it easier and more enjoyable to keep up with hydration. Action Water goes through a multi-stage purification and filtration process to ensure it's at peak quality. Action Water is at a 9.5 pH level or higher at the time of bottling. Plus, there are electrolytes added for taste with no sodium added. Learn more at drinkaction.com. That's drinkaction.com. Uh, Jamie Fiore Higgins, thank you so much for joining Imposters. Thank you so much for having me. So when you started at Goldman Sachs, it seems like you were immediately taken aback by the intensity of the culture that you were experiencing. How did you adjust or make sense of it? How did you reason to actually stay there despite having fear around what you were experiencing? I think it all comes to prestige and also the fact that, and this is with prestige, it's where everyone wanted to be. So even though it felt a little off to me and it felt kind of very punitive and um, intense, but intense in a less productive way, I'm all about intensity and working hard, but there's something to be said when you have something that everybody wants. And so certainly when I got the job at Goldman, I really got it because my parents really wanted to push me into a lucrative, you know, career, but also because it's just where everyone wanted to be. So even when it didn't sit well with me, I just thought, well, it just must be me because this is where everyone else wants to be. So clearly I have an issue. It's not me. It's not them. It's me. Totally. And just for those who aren't necessarily familiar with Goldman's culture or just financial services more broadly, mm. how would you describe the culture that you first experienced when you started working there? What, what was the vibe? So really the first day, the vibe was very punitive. So I'll never forget. Well, actually I can even back up and say, yeah, I had over 40 interviews, like four zero interviews, which at Goldman or in general, no, for my job at Goldman. I had, that is why. I had four zero interviews. And so that I actually was just like, what is this place? Because I had gotten other job offers throughout senior year with like five to 10 interviews. And the Goldman process, it just went on and on and on. So that kind of like rigor that it's like they were double checking, triple checking, quadruple checking. Um, so that kind of intensity, um, but really, 
it gave you a sense like, wow, this is a really special place. Like if I make it through here, you are really getting like the best of the best. So, you know, that kind of set the tone. And then my first day at work, they lock the doors on us at 7 a.m. So the, the training program started at 7. I got there a little early. I got my coffee. I go inside the, you know, movie theater-like room. And the guy comes in and he shuts the door and then he locks it, which just seems so odd to me. And then all of a sudden, we started hearing the banging on the door. And the guy's like, we start at 7, not 7.01, not 7.02, at 7.00. And at seven o'clock, I'm locking the doors. And if you are not in on time, you need to go find your partner who essentially is like your boss's boss or your boss's boss's boss and sign a letter excusing you for your tardiness. Yeah, that's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> and, and so it was this culture that was very much about like shaming you. So, you know, doors were locked. If you got the answer to the question, where did the Dow close wrong? You were like kicked out, you know, many times in tears. Um, so it was just this kind of like rule by fear and shame. And that's kind of very early on. I was just, it was very hard for me to kind of marry. Well, this is where everyone wants to be. And yet this is where everyone wants to be like, yeah, you know, um, but again, not having any experience in finance, not knowing anybody who worked in this world, I was just like, well, I guess this is just the way it is. And I just should shut up and be grateful. I got here. It's funny. We were talking obviously before the, the podcast about how I had spent a short period of time in finance as well. And I went through kind of all of the internships throughout college and almost the feeling that I got and I'm interested if you had a similar, similar sense or experience is that it felt in a lot of ways, like the pledging experience that I had when I was at the university of Michigan, pledging a fraternity where it's unpleasant, it's, uh, intense, but then you get through it and you feel like a badge of honor that you've been through it. And then you see that, you know, when you ask yourself, why has the culture stayed this way for so long? In some ways, the thought I always had is because people have experienced it, they feel kind of the uh, the permission to treat people in the manner that they were treated when they were coming up through the ranks. Did you have that similar type of perception? Yes. I mean, I never experienced that, but a hundred percent. And it really lands because years later, I was in charge of the analyst class and I locked the door and I kicked people out of rooms and I reveled in their fear and I would shame the women for the color of their nail polish, all this stuff that is like solely unproductive. But at the same time, it was, it was twofold. It was, I'm doing it for their own good. How else are they going to be successful without this? And then there was also a part that was like, you know what, just like the bully on the playground who's been bullied, you become the bully. And there is that weird sense of empowerment from that. It's really twisted. But I yeah. think at the time, I really did feel like I was doing it for their own good. Cause I'm like, you, you have to learn. This is the culture. You're not going to survive. You, you know, as my partner used to say, like you have to weed out the weak ones. In Jamie's book, she describes feeling extremely out of place during her first days at Goldman. In fact, she even earned the nickname Sister Jamie at the office because of how naive she was about the rampant drug use and open understanding of how sex with clients could advance your career. But Jamie was talented at building client relationships and finding the opportunity in smaller accounts. And eventually, Jamie worked her way up in the company. But working her way up at Goldman was both rewarding and terrifying because the more she surpassed her competitive colleagues, the more of a threat she became. At one point in her career, Jamie describes having to remove a colleague from a project because of the conflicts his affair with the client was creating, and this colleague proceeded to grab her by the throat and pin her against the wall in retaliation. This was the kind of toxic behavior Jamie experienced during her time at Goldman, and she says it was insidious. I call it the white noise of Wall Street, just the annoying banter, off-color jokes, you know, inappropriate jokes about women, um, about, you know, LGBTQ+, you know, that kind of stuff. 
not to say it isn't bad, but it wasn't so much targeted. It just kind of existed. What I observed was as I got more senior, it got more targeted. And I think um, that's for a few reasons. I think one, I was making more money and they're very good at making you feel like you're not going to make that money anywhere else. So it's almost like they know they have you and like, where are you going to go? Yeah. Um, whereas if you're making a lot less by definition, you have more options. If you're making a lot more, you don't. Um, so there's that element. And also that's when kind of the master manipulation can begin. Because as I got more senior, as they were paying me more money, as I felt like it was hard to walk away, that's when I feel like I was really paid for my silence. I was paid to um, ignore the stuff that happened to me, like the assault you talked about. It was basically like, sure, you could report it, Jamie, but I can't imagine your career is going to go well if you report this guy and you continue to work with him. So therefore, you know, my earning power, my ability to get promoted was going to be hurt. Same when other women came to me with similar stories, I would go to bat for them initially. I would always try and then I'd be like, well, do you really want to fight me on this? I think this woman is a drama queen and do you really want to fight me? Cause it's comp season and I'd really like to pay you well this year. And so once again, you kind of shut up. So there's definitely a method to the madness that as you get more senior and make more money, they use that as, um, an ability to keep you quiet. When you say they, mm. who are you referring to? Is it they, the institution? Is it they, the culture that everyone lives in? Is it they specific individuals within the bank? So for me, they really is like the power in those glass offices. For me, they was a very specific group of managers that ran my business. Um, but I can only say that those people were also just empowered by the organization I'm not suggesting that, you know, the C-suite knew exactly what was going on and even agreed with it. I am saying that they made so much money, they didn't care. The business, the business was profitable and they didn't care. So it was kind of like set it and forget it. I think they judged their businesses just on the P&L numbers, not even saying, hmm, I wonder what's really going on there at that organization. So I totally. can blame the greater... Um, environment for creating a world where that kind of behavior existed. To deal with the stress of Goldman's work environment, Jamie became dependent on Xanax. She also grew further from her family where she had three children under the age of three at home, and she became increasingly competitive at work where she was striving to be promoted to managing director. After 16 years, the intensity of Jamie's work life was hard to ignore. So what was the breaking point for you? When, when did you kind of look at just the trade-offs in life that you were assuming as a function of your situation at Goldman be like, even if I don't have these options, it's still not worth it. For me, it was um, my infidelity and unbeknownst to my five-year-old daughter um, catching me in the act over the phone. And that was kind of this, and don't get me wrong, this was a spiraling out over years. But at that moment, um, I can't articulate enough. I would have been the least likely person to ever have a relationship with someone while married. It just was so not in my nature, in my, in my very fabric and my character. And so the fact that not only was it happening, but that my daughter called me when I was out, you know, with a tummy ache, she was five really was this kind of moment for me that I was like, what have I become? You know, and again, it was years in the making. It was years of making choices and decisions that were completely counter to my values, lying on behalf of the firm, not protecting women, just making bad choices. And what I realized, Alex, were all these choices were these like coping mechanisms because I just wasn't happy. I was anxious. I was depressed. Um, I was, you know, relying on Xanax way too much to get through my day. Um, and that was really the moment that I said, you know what? None of this is worth it. Like, even if I never make a penny again, I'll figure it out. Like, it's just not worth the money anymore. We're going to take a quick break here, but when we come back, we'll get into what Jamie's life looks like after Goldman, what she thinks can be done to make positive changes on Wall Street, and how she dealt with the loss of her professional identity after leaving the firm. Stay with us.
On this show, I talk to people about overcoming the things that used to make them lose sleep. Anxiety, indecision, imposter syndrome, you name it. But once you've done the work to grow beyond your mental blocks, something as simple as an uncomfortable mattress can still stand between you and your best self. That's why I want to tell you about Purple. Their mattresses are made with their revolutionary gel flex grid that instantly adapts to movement and keeps you cool all night long so you can experience the restorative sleep you'll need to put your problems in the past. Experience life-changing sleep for yourself with fast, free shipping on select Purple mattresses. Visit a showroom or order online for a 100-night, no-pressure trial. Learn more at purple.com. That's P-U-R-P-L-E dot com. And we're back. Before the break, Jamie described what it was like to work her way up the ladder at Goldman Sachs and how the intense misogyny of the culture eventually caused her to break. Now, in the aftermath of leaving Goldman in 2016, Jamie focuses on coaching young and mid-career professionals on their own trajectories. In your work now, you spend a lot of time helping to provide support and advice to high school students, Mm -hmm. college students, and then mid-career folks who are thinking about um, reinventing themselves or just their next chapter. For the high school student or the college student who has this dream of working on Wall Street at a bulge bracket bank because their family does it, their dad's a partner at Goldman, their mom is an MD at Morgan Stanley. How do you navigate providing advice to them given what you've experienced? So for me, so much of my career was doing it for the sake of my family. And... um, Even my brother, who's older than I am, when I was thinking about leaving, he said, you know, run with the baton as far as you can. Like you've elevated the family to kind of these new heights. And so my view was I'll run with this baton, but I will never hand it to anyone else. So to me, I feel like when I work with these young people, you know, when I started at Goldman, their tagline was minds wide open. Um, we're very open-minded to all different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. What I say to these young people are have your eyes wide open in terms of what you're really getting into. And the nice thing about being young in 2022 is information is so democratized now. It's so much easier to get a good sense of what's really going on in organizations. So I feel like better than ever, people are able to make more educated decisions about where they work. Because here's the thing. You're passionate about finance, great. There are a lot of places you can do finance. And so really make sure the experience you want is the experience you get. And so you know what? You want to try a big firm like Goldman & Morgan? Fantastic. And you know what? My story about Goldman is my story. There are thousands of other people who I'm sure have had amazing experiences at these firms. The key is knowing when it's okay to make decisions to go elsewhere. And that's my, that was my problem. That's what I wish someone did for a 24 year old Jamie Fiore to say, you know what? You're not lucky to have Goldman. Goldman's lucky to have you. You made it through 40 interviews because you're smart and you're sharp and you could be successful anywhere. Jamie Fiore from, you know, 1999, 2000 really felt like She had no other options. And so to me, it's really making sure these young people know they have options because you know what, Alex, sometimes when you know you have options to leave, you're okay to stay because you're not stuck. It's your choice. Yeah. I I think you make such an important point about understanding not only that you have options and especially in kind of. I would say the the context we live in now, there truly are more options. You know, obviously we've seen this this huge groundswell of tech companies that have attracted what would have traditionally been financial services talent. But I also think to that point, just understanding uh, the leverage you have, like that you are you were picked for a reason because you're very capable, but also controlling what you can control and living a life that allows you to maintain your leverage said differently, uh, living a life that doesn't require you to necessarily make exactly what you're making at Goldman so that you do have the optionality to go somewhere else. Even if it's for a little bit of a cut, you leave that option open. A hundred percent. And you know, I always talk to 
you know, my clients, I'm like, your career is like a pie, right? You have the compensation, you have the passion, you have the flexibility, right? It's like at Goldman, it was all compensation, a little yep. bit of passion, no flexibility. I don't even begrudge people for taking a career if they're okay with it and they know at any time they can redesign that for themselves and make other choices. And I think that large organizations like Goldman um, are very, very good at gaslighting you. I know that's such a common word now, but I really felt like I had no options. And the biggest joke of it all is that I felt like a prisoner, but the door was never locked. Yeah, it was always open. So when I work with young people, it's to let them know this whole concept of stuck is in your head. Nobody is stuck. We are all employers of free will. And there are always options. And to your point, you know what, like, Maybe you, you are working in a high paying, low passion, low flexibility, you wanna make a change? Well, how much money do you really need? Let's really speak frankly about it. Something that you've talked a lot about is after you reached that breaking point, after you left your role at Goldman, after you had spent so long trying to achieve what you ultimately achieved, which was becoming an MD within this prestigious bank, you had, I don't know if I'd go as far to say an identity crisis, but you very much were wondering, you know, who is Jamie today? And I have heard this kind of same feeling from people in so many different careers. I felt this when I moved out of the CEO role at Morning Brew, went into the chairman role. I was actually talking to uh, my wedding planner this uh, weekend and his husband was a teacher for 36 years in the New York City Department of Education, just retired and talked about how difficult it was for him to move out of being a teacher. Mm -hmm. Talk about what this was like for you and how you've worked through it. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how much we identify with what we do. And, you know, at Goldman, it was always like, you can only leave Goldman once. You can only leave Goldman once. You know, people would kill for this job. You can only leave Goldman once. And you know, when I had that moment, when my daughter called me that day, I said, I gotta get out of there and I left. I was lost and depressed. Lost and depressed because that identity of being a managing director at Goldman Sachs, that, presti that prestige and pride, it was like what grounded me to the earth. And it was like, mm -hmm. well, who am I now? And um, it was a really hard lesson to learn, but I know so many other people have been through it too. And as I kind of decompressed from that world and detoxed from that world, I kind of began to see me as who I am versus what I just do. And I realized even though I was no longer in 200 West Street, I still retained myself. Other than my work ID, I was still me. And all those skills that made me successful at Goldman, I still had at my disposal. It was just a matter of figuring out how I wanted to deploy them. And um, that I think is is the slippery slope. And you know, it, it, it has nothing even to do with money. It's just kind of the pride you have in the role, whether mm -hmm. you make a ton of money or you don't. And it's really, I think, being able to kind of have that autonomy and have that awareness of what is you and what is you at the firm, you know, at Goldman, um, when you answer the phone, you were Jamie from Goldman. I mean, you know, it's like literally it was a Goldman was my surname. Um, and so when I lost it, I really lost a piece of me. But then after time, I realized it was always there. And I said, okay, I still have all these skills. Now I get to be creative and figure out new ways to deploy them. Do you think it's possible for the industry to change? Um, do, you, do you believe that the culture of Goldman, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan are different today than when you experienced it? And do you think it is possible for these cultures to actually be something that people will be excited, proud, and feel safe to work in in the future? I think things are improving. I mean, listen, even when I first started Goldman, I don't even think there was a woman's network or an affinity network. I mean, just the fact that they have people focused on DEI now is important. So yes, things have been improving. 
I would like to think my assault today would not have happened or would not have been tolerated, I should say. It might have happened, but you know, that guy is still working in the industry today. I would have liked to have think if that happened today, he'd be gone. Um, but I do think more work needs to be done. I think that they're saying the right things. I think they're saying it's important. I think especially on Wall Street, in an industry that is so focused on metrics, market share, profitability. I mean, at Goldman, they slice and dice everything. I think they really need to bring metrics to the table with regard to these things, quantifiable measures that they commit to and they report on. And if they fall short, to explain why. So for example, at Goldman Sachs, they hire 50% women, which is fantastic. A lot of them leave. Where do they go? Like, I know Goldman has the resources to track these candidates and figure out why. I know Goldman has the resources to get real active coaching to kind of help navigate these people through the process. You know, it's hard if you want to achieve kind of more equity and inclusion and diversity. It's hard, right? Because most of the people in the glass offices aren't diverse, right? So it's hard when you're coming up, you want to look at that glass office and see yourself. Then you say, maybe I can be that person someday. Okay. We're not there yet, but let's start getting the pipeline going. Let's start getting some mentoring in. So while we wait for it to happen, they're not going to have 50% partners at Goldman next year, but wouldn't it be great if they said in 15 years time, we want 50% of the partners to be women. They could hit that. They could hit it. If they yeah. really put the numbers on it, that's what I really think is needed in order them, for them to change. That's the kind of commitment they need. And I haven't seen that commitment yet. I've seen a lot of press releases. I've seen a lot of talking points. I've seen a lot of really nice sentiments, but until they're quantified, it's so easy for them just to kind of, you know, flow away in, into the ether. Yeah. I think my personal view is, I think until there is the incentive, the true incentive to make change. And when I say incentive, that there's concern to the long-term prospects of the value of the business, the value to shareholders, I think making any sort of meaningful change that's not performative in nature is quite difficult, or at least my view is unlikely. Um, and so I think even the change we've made that has been made now I think in a lot of ways can be attributed to the fact that there's been a, a shit ton of attrition to other companies, to other industries, because frankly, pay is quite high in those industries now. Mm -hmm. Career prospects are clearer than they used to be in non-financial services roles. And so I think there there's fear about what if we lose out on the best talent in the world. And so I feel like almost like the marketplace has to create the incentive for financial services firms to change. And I think in a lot of ways, that's why they are making these press releases and making these yeah. intents because it's good to attract people. What I'm saying is it's meaningless unless they really show they're doing it. 100%. So to me, I totally if agree. I were a consumer, if I were looking and I'm like, okay, well, DEI is important. Yeah, but this firm is saying that they are going to be, they're putting this obligation on themselves to hit these things. And if they don't, someone's head's going to roll, right? Just like heads roll when certain, you know, profitability targets aren't met. And so yep. I'm hoping you're right. You know, I would love to be in a world where they do it because it's the right thing to do, but hopefully they're doing it because they know that's what they need to do to con continue being that kind of premier employer of choice in the industry. Yep. I have one last question for you. It's 1998. You're starting at Goldman. You're locked inside your training at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. And the Jamie Fiore Higgins of today is a little birdie on the shoulder of her younger self. What would you say to Jamie at the time? that you think would help inform her journey for years to come? Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Um, question. So I think that was really the key. I had so many 
um, my spidey sense tingled all the time there. Like this just doesn't seem right. This just doesn't seem right. Um, so I would say, trust your gut. And I would have said to her, don't be afraid because you know, um, I wasn't trusting my gut. And part of that was because I was afraid to acknowledge what was really going on. And I think that if I had shown myself that there are so many more opportunities out there that, um, that I was there because of me, I think that I would have made very different decisions early on in my career. You can have a career that's in line with your values and still be successful. Um, that you don't have to sell your soul in order to achieve success. That honestly, that the paycheck isn't worth all the pain. That it doesn't have to be that way. Love it. That the paycheck isn't worth all the pain. Jamie Fiore Higgins, thank you so much for joining Imposters. Thank you, Alex. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed and I'd love to hear from you. Share in the comments your favorite part of this episode and also what guests you would love to see on Imposters moving forward. And finally, like and subscribe so you get content from this show every single week. I'll see you guys next time.